And, um, you know, you don't need me to tell you, do you, that it's been a strange time for us as a church these last six months. Social distancing and lockdown and Zoom and face coverings. I don't think any of us saw this coming, did we, uh, a year ago? And there's been huge changes, and change isn't easy. And for some, I'm sure it's thrown up big questions about the nature and significance of the church. What is the church? Does it really matter? You know, many people think of church as a building, don't they? Think of how we say, we're going to church. I'll meet you at church. What about when the building is forced to close? Does the church continue? Or is that it? Or others think of church as an event. You know, we say it's time for church. What did you think of church this morning? Well, what about when that event looks and feels nothing like it did before? Is it still worth coming to? Is it still worth getting up for? Some of you might have read about the kind of attendance rising as services went online. So I read read, um, one US report suggesting that around Easter, half of churches reported online attendance greater than normal attendance. But that same report wrote that three months into lockdown, 71% said it was already flat or lower. And actually by that stage, 48% of churchgoers said they hadn't watched any church online in the last four weeks. Actually, people were fairly quickly disillusioned. Or, Or in this country, you know, the way in which the government has structured the opening up has given us a bit of a sense, hasn't it, of how our wider society views the church. It's a leisure activity, similar to theatres or pubs or bingo halls. You know, great for those who are into that kind of thing, but far from essential. And maybe in all the turbulence, you've been reassessing the church. Maybe you've been asking those questions. What is church? Does it really matter? Well, over these next few months, we're going to be hearing together from the book of Ephesians. And it's a book that addresses both those questions. Ephesians says emphatically that far from being an optional extra, the church is the focus of God's plans for humanity, for the whole of human history. So listen to a a couple of verses from chapter 3. His intent, God's intent, was that now, through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be known, made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It, it kind of blows our minds, doesn't it, the size of that? Or well, then later in chapter 3, to him, to God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's a bit bigger than a bingo hall, isn't it? And Ephesians says not only that, but the church is ultimately neither a building or an event, but a people. God is bringing together men and women from all kinds of backgrounds to form a new humanity in Christ. So again, listen to these two verses from chapter 2. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. And then later on in chapter 2, he says to these believers, this church in Ephesians, in Ephesus, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, the title for our series, based um, largely on those verses, is God's Building Project. Ephesians is about what God is doing in the world. It's about his master plan. Not bricks and mortar, but people united in Christ and renewed by the Spirit. So as we come to Ephesians chapter 1 this morning, let me pray for us that that through his word, uh, God would be at work in our life as a church. Father, we thank you that you speak to us. We thank you for this book, Ephesians. Lord, not just a letter uh, written by Paul in the first century, but the living, your living words spoken to us today. And Lord, over the coming months as we hear from, from this part of your word, we pray that you'd speak to us, that you'd help us to hear what you have to say. But Lord, we pray too that you would shape us and change us. Lord, that your word would make us Uh, More and more, you would help us to live out the people that you've made us in Christ. Thrill us again 
with the wonder of your grace. Inspire us with the grandeur of your purpose in the church. Unite us to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and spur us to live distinctively as your chosen people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me read. Um, We're going to be looking at Ephesians 1, 1 to 10 this morning. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I'll just keep going, though we're going to stop there this morning. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now we get the context of the book, or a bit of the context, in that very first verse. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to followers of Jesus Christ in the city of Ephesus, at what is now Western Turkey. And we know from Acts 19, Paul had spent about two years preaching the good good news of Jesus in Ephesus. But by the time he writes, probably about six to eight years have passed. So he's writing around 62 AD. And by that point, Paul writes to them from Rome, where he's under house arrest. And the letter is probably taken by Tychicus, who's mentioned towards the end. But, you know, Ephesians flies out the blocks, doesn't it, as a letter? You know, as soon as the greeting is over, we we get this remarkable passage of praise. As I was thinking about it, it reminded me a bit of our first visit um, to the Yorkshire Dales when uh, when we moved to Bradford. Uh, We drove up to Grassington, and there's a kind of visitor centre car park there, so we thought that'd be a good place to start. Um, And, you know, we'd barely got out of the car park. We just kind of wandered down a little track. And you're there at Linton Falls, which is this... And and it must have rained a lot over the last few weeks. It was just pouring with water. Um, It was a lovely day, but there was water everywhere in terms of the waterfall. And you stand on the bridge in the middle, and it's a wonderful kind of sensation, the noise of it, the life, the energy... Uh, you know, when, there's, when it's like that, it's hard to know where to focus, isn't it? There's water kind of bubbling forth uh, from, from every point. And it kind of reminds, the start of Ephesians reminded me of that. You know, we're barely out the car park. We finish the greeting and boom, you know, there's this, this torrent of praise, isn't there? Actually, in the original Greek, that section I read, verses 3 to 14, which is why I read a little bit longer, that's one long sentence. You know, you can just, you, no pause. <laughs> it all just comes out, 202 words of praise pouring forth. And it's a benediction. It's Paul praising God for for the blessings he has given us in Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it begins. It's this wonderful kind of cascade, isn't it, of praise, bubbling over with all that God has done. And in this first section of the book, Paul's kind of zooming right back to give us the cosmic perspective. The church is God's doing. That's what Paul's saying here. It's his plan to bless us in Christ for the praise of his glorious grace. So so firstly, we see so clearly here, don't we, that it's his plan. It's God's plan. Um, Some of you will know with with Google, when you're using Google, you can be on kind of Street View or Maps or Google Earth. You know, when you're on Street View, that's kind of the view we get. So this, I I did this this morning. 
You know, this is the view we get as we're coming down to the building, isn't it? And when, you know, this is the, our normal view of life, isn't it? You know, we're, our, our horizon is filled with buildings, you know, and, and cars and signs and things that are on eye level. What's immediately in front of our face? But on Google Maps, you can kind of zoom out a little bit and see, you know, how the bits fit together. You know, where one street fits in the city as a whole. And then with Google Earth, you zoom even further back. You go right back to the big picture. You know, what are we part of? How do the continents fit together? You get a much clearer sense of how we fit in the whole. And Ephesians chapter 1 is doing the same thing with human history. You know, it's zooming right out to give us the big picture of what God is doing in the world. So if you like, our kind of day-to-day, -day, our street view is this, isn't it? If we can have the next slide up. You know, it's, it's, it's what our, our, our view is filled with day-to-day. -day. You know, we read in the news at the moment that's full of coronavirus, isn't it? I think that was the news this morning. And on Facebook, we're seeing what everybody's doing that day, the ho lovely holidays they're having. You know, the beautiful pictures of all their, their lovely meals. And then we've got things in our diary, haven't we? The things coming up that day. Maybe a big event that's looming on the horizon. And that's kind of our, our street view. Uh, you know, those are the things which fill our minds. And yet we can zoom out a little bit, can't we? And if we zoom out a little bit and a little bit more, we start to realize that actually those things are, are, are part of a bigger thing. So if you zoom out even further, you know, we then have other events that have gone on in recent history, the moon landings or World War II that give a little bit of perspective. But obviously God's perspective focuses on the things he thinks is important. So if we zoom out again, you know, it focuses primarily on Jesus Christ and what he's doing in the Lord Jesus. But Ephesians chapter 1 goes even further back. So if we can zoom out to the last one, Ephesians chapter 1 goes right back. So did you notice what Paul said in verse 4? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. It's remarkable, isn't it? That's how far back Ephesians is looking. Before anything physical existed, before the sun was here or the earth was made. Do you see how far back this, this is zooming? There is God. And then, it, you know, it, it focuses on what's going on in the present. So in, in verse 7, we read, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, the, the, a huge point in human history, from God's perspective, in terms of his plan, is Jesus' death and resurrection. But actually, by the end of these verses, we zoom right forward to where all this is heading. So um, look at, um, if you've got a Bible with you, in verse 10, um, 1 verse 10, it talks about God's plan to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So we start right at the beginning, and we go right to the end of where human history is heading. And um, you might have noticed those words in verse 9. Paul talks about God making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Now, when we, talk, when we use the word mystery, we mean kind of mysterious, don't we? Something that's a bit vague and, and hard to get your head around. That's not how the Bible uses the word mystery. In the Bible, the word mystery means secret. So something that, that wasn't known and has now been revealed. So it's, now it's something that we know. So the point is that in Christ, through the book of Ephesians even, God has made his plan to us known. So this was secret. God knew it and hum humankind didn't. But now in Jesus, God has made his plan known. It's out there. It's in public. So actually, we know God's plan for human history. That's no small thing, is it? You know, there's, we live in a day where there's a lot of confusion. As people look to the future, there's all kind of questions. Actually, we know where God is taking things, which, which gives us great assurance in all that's going on. And when um, Paul talks here about um, uniting all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, he's talking, you know, currently there's, there's disunity, isn't there? There's disunity between creation and the creator. Heaven and earth are separate spheres. And, and we are separated from God's people of, of a different age. And so, actually, history is heading to a point where, where, all of, where God's creation and also God's redeemed people from across the ages are united in the Lord Jesus, when heaven and earth are brought together under God's appointed king. You know, that's where God is taking things. And this is all of God's doing. It's his master plan, his initiative. And we see that most clearly, don't we, in that little phrase, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. 
That means that, that the gospel, the Christian message, is actually rooted in the triune God himself. You know, Christianity is very clear that there is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And sometimes people think, well, isn't that something the church made up? Well, no, this is how God reveals himself in Scripture. It's here, isn't it, in our passage. Look at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's God the Father and God the Son, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The sense there is probably blessings of the Spirit. But that the Holy Spirit is also, he's explicitly mentioned later in verse 13. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. God has revealed himself in the scriptures as Father, Son, and Spirit. And it's not like the Son and the Spirit joined in later. You know, it might be that God has revealed himself over time, but God has always existed as Trinity, as Father, Son, and Spirit in loving union. So actually, you know, it's hard, isn't it, to imagine before the creation of the world. It's hard for us to kind of do that imaginative task. But it wasn't nothing. God existed. And sometimes we, you know... We need to remember God is a personal God. You know, there were, were three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally relating to one another. And they weren't lacking in any way. They weren't bored before the creation of the world. They weren't lonely. God, God wasn't missing something. You know, actually, uh, the, God in himself was fully satisfied as, as the three persons of the Godhead related to one another. Remarkably, before the creation of the world, what happened, this passage says, is that the triune God made a decision to share himself, to share his love and his life with us. Now, now God didn't have to do that. He wasn't under contract. There was no compulsion. He did that because that's who he is. That's his nature, his character. And that plan that God had before the creation of the world, it wasn't just some vague plan to create humankind. Ephesians says that God, at that point, planned for the church, a people set apart for himself. Again, isn't that an amazing thing to think? Before the Son was created, God was thinking about the church. Isn't that incredible? You know, you go out and you see, see the moors or you see the sea. Before all that was made, before that existed, God was thinking about the church. He was thinking about drawing people into a new community, in the Lord Jesus, redeeming them to live holy lives for him. Now, this whole idea of, of choosing, you know, which often we call election, there are all sorts of questions that come up with that. We're going to look at those more next week because um, the next passage also speaks about this theme. But it's important to say here, you know, what is the point of, of Paul telling us this? Why does he tell us that, that this is all God's intention? It's all God's work. It's all God's plan. Well, the point here is that means it's of grace, doesn't it? It's a gift to us. There's, there's, if God was planning for us to come to know him, to be forgiven through the Lord Jesus and part of his new community before the earth was even made, how can we take any credit for that? See, there's, there's no room, is there here, for spiritual pride. There's no room for spiritual superiority to meet, for me to feel like I'm a better Christian than you are. Do you see how that, that makes a mockery of that, doesn't it? Actually, this is all of God. Anything we have spiritually is a gift. And it's come out of God's overwhelming generosity. So I think it, within the book of Ephesians, actually this passage is, is right there at the front. So that when he starts to talk about our relations to one another, we've got it in perspective. Anything we have in Christ is a gift. It's God's doing. But also... You know, when we see God's plan here, we see the significance of the church, don't we? It's not merely a leisure activity for those who are a bit religious. It's not merely something we do on a Sunday morning if we've got time. Again, you know, right now our world, our kind of horizon is full of coronavirus and the economy and celebrities, isn't it? And some of those things are very important, some less so. But, but Ephesians, if you like, is the Google Earth. And, and as God looks at human history, the thing that jumps out to him, the thing that looms large, is the church. He's had his eye on it since before the world was made. And it continues to hold his attention. So 
So it's his plan. It's his plan to bless us in Christ. You know, this is a passage exploding with blessing, isn't it? Overflowing with blessing. But it's very clear that all this blessing is found in Christ. So in verses 1 to 14, that little phrase, in Christ or in him, comes up 11 times. In that sense, you know, God has put all his eggs in one basket, and that is the Lord Jesus. That's how he's accomplishing his plan. Um, when we were on holiday, we were on holiday recently in Pembrokeshire in South Wales, and there was no reception. So, you know, I had my phone with me, but it couldn't do anything at all. There was no phone reception, there was no Wi-Fi, no internet, nothing. It's good news for a holiday, actually. But, but it meant that this little device, which normally I kind of rely on for all kinds of different things, was useless. You know, it didn't do anything for me. There was, I couldn't make phone calls or do messages, check emails, find out the weather, you know, research on maps, stream music or videos, couldn't check WhatsApp, nothing, because there was no signal. You know, this was just a waste of space in the pocket, really. But, what, you know, it, it's always the way, isn't it, when you go to a place like this? You know, before long, we'd found the signal point. You know, so if you, if you went across the bridge and up the other side, there was a place where if you stood at the top of the hill and kind of waved your phone around, you'd get some signal. And, and the point is, once there was signal, then all of those things came back. Phone calls, messages, emails, weather, music, it all came back. Because that's how phones work, doesn't it? And in a similar sense, perhaps, what, what Paul is saying here is that all the spiritual blessings that God pours out to us are found in Christ. Outside of Christ, there are no spiritual blessings. This is why we make such a big deal of Jesus, isn't it? Sometimes that can seem a little bit exclusive. Well, it is exclusive. But because God makes very clear that all the blessings he has for, for his people are found in Christ. All these spiritual blessings are found in him. And, you know, it's, it's, it's clear, isn't it, that um, this, this displays God's grace, his gift, his generosity. I want to just do a thought experiment for a moment and try and bring to mind, you know, the time you've experienced rich generosity. You know, the time when you were just overwhelmed by, by generosity. Maybe it was a, a birthday where people really spoiled you. Maybe it was a gift that someone gave you. Maybe it was something someone said. Just try and actually bring that to mind, that moment. I guess we'd all have examples of that. You know, I think both of us uh, have, have, have been really overwhelmed recently on um, significant birthdays when people have just shared love and gone way over and above anything we've expected. You'll have examples in your own mind. That, that, that is a little taste of the riches of God's generosity. And, and this passage really um, pours out with that, doesn't it? You know, the, it talks about the riches of God's grace that he's lavished on us. And three blessings are highlighted in particular. Uh, his forgiveness, the forgiveness we enjoy in Christ, redemption and adoption. You know, and, and again, all of these aren't blessings God has to give us. They're blessings he generously pours out on us. So forgiveness talks about sin. You know, sin is the hostility that alienates us from God. It's the ways in which we fall short and we disobey. Sin is the reason that actually there's a, there's a barrier between us and God. And that is why all of this is in Christ. You know, in a sense, with phone signal, it can seem a bit arbitrary, can't it? You know, why is it that on that hill I get some, when I'm over here, there's nothing? It, it seems a bit random. But God giving us all these spiritual blessings only in Christ is not arbitrary or random. It's because they come through his blood. You know, that is why it's exclusive and it's in him. It's at the cross that sin is dealt with, that that barrier between us and God is dealt with, so that we no longer face his wrath. That, that, that uh, the long list of accusations against us is wiped clean. And God could have stopped there, couldn't he? That would have been very generous <laughs> for, to, for God to forgive us as his people, and to leave it there. But God didn't stop there. You know, this passage says that in Christ and by his blood we have redemption. Redemption is the language of buying back. So not only did God forgive us so that we no longer face his judgment and his wrath, but he brought us back to himself. 
You know, Jesus' blood was also the price with which God purchased him, purchased us, so that now we belong to God. And again, God could have stopped there, couldn't he? Simply that we belong to him. And that would have been far above anything we deserved. But this passage goes on. No, we are adopted. In Christ, we're adopted, included in God's family. As sons, as children, as heirs. And again, think of the picture of adoption, how that works. You know, when you're outside the family, well, you don't enjoy any of the blessings of that family, do you? And then when you're adopted, you enjoy all the blessings of being in that family. Relationship with the parents. Being part of that house and that home. Holidays and trips that people go on. Meals. You you, you look forward to the inheritance that is coming. And that is how God treats us in Christ. What generosity. Not only does he forgive us, not only does he redeem us, but he adopts us and brings us into his family. And it's obvious, isn't it, that the, the response to all this should be gratitude in our hearts. You know, this is a passage that should leave us full of praise. I, I found at the moment it's easy to feel sorry for yourself, isn't it, with all that's going on. You know, there's a, it's a season of a lot of disappointment. It's a season where circumstances are harder than normal. And I certainly have found it's easy to kind of drift and wallow in self-pity. But do you see how self-pity is exactly the opposite of Ephesians 1? Self-pity says we've been hard done by. People owe us. And actually not only is that destructive for, for ourselves and those around us, but it's a warped view of reality. You know, imagine if you went round assessing how wealthy you were based on what you had in your pocket at any given time. I guess for most of us, that would be a pretty, you know, depressing reality. You know, just based on how many coins you happen to have in your pocket, or whether you had a fiver tucked into your phone. You know, we don't do that, do we? Because I guess for, for many of us, most of our money will be in a bank account. And actually, it's far more secure there. And that changes the picture, doesn't it, when we bring that into effect. I'm sure it's not quite what we'd all want it to be, but it's usually more than what's in our pocket. And in a sense, sometimes I think that's, that's what we can do. You know, we assess things based on our immediate circumstances. So if we're facing a hard day, then that fills in the whole picture. And we're thrown into self-pity. Ephesians 1, if you like, helps us to look at our bank account, to look at the true reality, the true picture. And of course, this isn't a material bank account. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ stored up in the heavenly realms. And actually, that means they're far more secure than if Nat West has got hold of them, or whoever it might be. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're rich in him. We're secure. Do you see how God has been overwhelmingly generous to us? And actually, when we grasp this, then that that leads to gratitude in our hearts, even when circumstances are hard. And it leads to generosity with others. Because God has been so rich to us. So here's an idea. You know, if like me, actually, you're battling with self-pity a bit in this season. Maybe read Ephesians 1 to 14 when you wake up in the morning. Or print these verses out. You know, put them by your bed. Put them by your desk. As a reminder of God's riches to you. God's generosity to you in Christ. Now I'm running over a little bit, which means... um, If you've got children in the um, children's groups, if you could head out, that would be helpful because teachers will bring them down shortly. Um, So don't worry about doing that. If you're in the main hall of the lounge, it would be helpful if you could just head out to collect your children from the car park. But we're going to continue. There's there's one more thing which is very significant that we see um, in this passage. This is God's plan to bless us in Christ for the praise of his glorious grace. You know, I think for a long time when I looked at Ephesians 1, I sort of thought of it as all the spiritual goodies that we get in God. You know, all the good stuff I get from Jesus. And it's so easy, isn't it, for us to make the gospel very small and very me-centered. You know, I've been forgiven so that I can go to heaven. But Ephesians 1 shows us the gospel's far bigger than that. It's God's plan for human history. And actually the end of it is God's praise. So think about how we began in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or in verse 6, um, Paul says we, we've been adopted 
to the praise of his glorious grace. And many of you, um, or some of you very closely, some of you less closely, will have been following Leeds United you know, over this last year. And there's a few in here for whom that's been a very significant thing this year. Uh, in July, Leeds were promoted to the Premier League as winners of the championship. And that was a moment of huge re- celebration and rejoicing in Leeds, maybe less in Bradford, but certainly in Leeds. And even in lockdown, there were huge you know, celebrations. And of course, in the midst of that, there was praise for the players, wasn't there? But ultimately, who did people give credit to? Well, it was someone who wasn't even on the pitch. It was Bielsa, the Leeds manager. Now, he's been manager there for about two years. And even before he'd came, he'd done meticulous research on the club and their players. You know, he'd come in with a plan. And that's what he's known for, really, the detail. And, and Leeds love him. So have a look at this mural. Probably a bit too much. You know, Leeds love him uh, because of what he's done at the club. Now, just think for a moment. You know, if, if Leeds, if, if people praise Bielsa as the mastermind of Leeds' success, how much more does the triune God deserve our praise? You know, on that mural, you could put in brackets underneath, couldn't you? In Bielsa, we trust you know, to to help Leeds over the next couple of seasons or something. It's qualified. But actually, in God we trust for the whole of human history. How much more he deserves our praise because he is masterminded. Ian, you can take that down now. I know I'll have to tell you. (laughs) But how much more he deserves our praise because God has masterminded not merely a football club winning promotion, but the whole of human history. He's planned that in advance, in meticulous detail. You know, and as we look at the church, we might see what happens on the pitch, if you like. People's lives transformed. A community that loves one another. People growing in godliness. But all the credit belongs to God. It's his doing, isn't it? You know, again, with Bielsa, actually the players deserve some of the credit. They were already good players before he arrived. That's partly why he came. But with us, with our salvation, with the church... God has done everything. All of this is his gift to us. All of this is his kindness to us. So if Leeds fans go out and celebrate and paint the city for Bielsa, how much more should our lives overflow and bubble over with praise to the living God? And remember, I I talked right at the beginning about that waterfall. You know, when you're facing something like that, and that's just a small waterfall, but I'm sure people have been to bigger ones. In the end, all you can do is stand there and look at it and think, wow, can't you? That's the right response. And that is the right response for what God has done. That we as his people stand back and say, wow, praise be to you. How how great is your grace? How generous you are. And this is why not singing together is so hard, isn't it? Because singing isn't an add-on. Praise is not a kind of add-on to the Christian life that we can just dismiss. Actually, praise is the end of all this. You know, God has worked all this to the praise of his glorious grace. So it is, we should struggle with not singing together. You know, because actually that is where uh, all of this is heading. And I guess just just speaking into that for a moment, you know, I I think for the moment it is right uh, for us not to sing as we gather together on a Sunday morning. But it shouldn't stop our praise, should it? You know, that's not the, that praise isn't reduced to singing songs together in person on a Sunday morning. There's other ways to praise. Maybe, maybe it means if, if we can't sing like we'd normally sing on a Sunday morning, we need to be thinking of another slot or other slots in our week where we can sing praise wholeheartedly to the living God. Maybe actually we need to gather with whoever's in our home or our, our bubble before church on a Sunday to sing. Maybe it means actually as we go home today, over, over, you know, over the lunch table, we need to sing to the living God. Maybe there's another slot in the week. Um, there's, there's, if you want a place to start for that, I've, if you look on the app, I've put a link to a song called Come Praise and Glorify, which basically just takes the words of Ephesians 1. So that would be a great thing to do today. Find time today to go and sing that with whoever you're allowed to sing with. And, and um, I think James recently has put up a lot of videos on our YouTube, which again are just songs that we sing, um, recorded by the band here. So use those. Maybe this is a challenge for us, again, okay, application from today. Uh, as, we, as we go away from today, find one slot this week where you're going to sing uh, praise to the living God. That might be in the morning as you get up. We, we do that as a family around the breakfast table. 
You know, it's not the most tuneful. You know, we forget the word sometimes. But it's a, it's a great way to start the day because it reminds us of who our God is and gives praise to him. I guess that's my challenge for all of us. You know, if, we, if we're not able to sing like we'd normally do here, let's find another slot in the week uh, to bring praise to the living God. Well, we're going to, in a moment, the musicians will lead us. Um, but let me pray for us first. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and for your generosity. Lord, we marvel at your character. Father, Son, and Spirit, there you were before the world had even been created. Lord, content, satisfied in yourself, and yet you chose to share yourself with us there in that moment. Lord, you were thinking of the church. What a remarkable thing that you would include us as part of your plan. Lord, what a remarkable thing. Not only would you forgive us for our sin in Christ and through his blood, not only do you buy us so that we belong to you, but you adopt us into your family. Full members of your family. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. Lord, it's far beyond anything we deserve, anything we could imagine. And Lord, we're sorry when, particularly in this season, we've drifted into self-pity. We're sorry when we grumble. Lord, we're sorry when we act as if we've been hard done by. And Lord, we pray that you would renew this perspective in us. Lord, so that instead of being self-consumed, we'd be consumed by you. Lord, we pray that just as if you go to the city of Leeds, you see Beelzebub's face. Lord, we pray that, that your name, Lord, would be all over our lives. We pray that, that your praise will bubble out from us. Lord, that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.